Distel, a global liquor business with its roots in South Africa, has recently relisted on the JSC. This involved quite a complex financial restructure for the maker of popular alcohol brands like Amarula, Savannah, Hunter's Dry and Durbanville Hills. I'm sitting here with Ferdy Forster from R&B Corporate Finance, who's going to help me unpack the intricacies of this deal. Distel has a long history in South Africa, but it has a complicated shareholding structure. Can you explain how they found themselves in such a position? Thanks, Sasha. Yeah, I mean, as you may know, I mean, this, this structure has been in place for a very long time. Uh, I think more than 20 to 30 years. Um, and, you know, the starting point was that there were roughly three uh, shareholder categories. There was a company called RCI, which held uh, roughly 53% or 52.8% to be more specific. Um, and at that time, the PIC also held 28%, uh, which they acquired uh, recently or about two years ago. And then there was the last category, which is the, the normal shareholders, which is roughly uh, 19% uh, and which will qualify as, as, as your free float. The RCI structure itself was a difficult one because on top of that there were two shareholders. RCI was unlisted. Um, on top of that you had Ramgro, which owned 50% of that uh, company, um, and Cape Vin. Cape Vin itself, also a listed company, and it has its own set of shareholders. RCI was Cape Vin's only uh, asset at that point in time. Um, and for example, Ramgro and PIC uh, were shareholders of Cape Vin as well. So you can see it was quite a spider web of, of shareholders all around. And what made it difficult was that because RCI held the 52.8% um, and the PIC also had more than 25%, you effectively had two shareholders which had a blocking vote. The one controls the company and the other one have a blocking vote. And that created a massive hindrance on the ability of the company to grow. So that was our starting point and that's when we started to look at this thing roughly four years ago together with the company. Four years ago, wow. So they found themselves in a difficult position. The JSC doesn't like these structures, investors don't like these structures. So the company approached RMB to say, help us unbundle this, help us simplify this. But it wasn't that easy, was it? It was a fairly difficult process. Um, I mean, as you would imagine, when we start looking at these type of scenarios, we always need to design a transaction that we think is likely to be approved by the shareholders as well as the, as the regulators and comply with all the necessary uh, laws, for example. Um, so shareholders wanted something um, and the regulators need to approve these transactions. The JSE, there was rules at some point in time where these hybrid control structures were allowed by the JSE rules. Those rules don't exist anymore and um, they've been removed from, uh, from, from the JSE rules. So we had to find a way to almost duplicate this existing scenario but weave it into the current, current regulatory environment. So, um, you know, we had, to, we had to design a specific share, which we call the B share, it's an unlisted share. And through that, uh, we were able to mirror roughly the existing control structure, if I can put it like that, but a much simplified mechanism. Um, and it took us about four years um, to negotiate with the JSE uh, to get that specific share approved. Clearly, the stell is in an unlisted environment, the share is unlisted. So they had to give us, uh, give us special permission to do that. Um, they regulated by the FSB, they had to go to the FSB to get their approval. Um, and ultimately, because the TRP looks after minority shareholders, we had to go to the TRP and get their approval. The one thing about this B share, um, it's got comprehensive rights attaching to it. But clearly because it's in existence, it creates a bit of dilution for the non-holders of these shares. So where a shareholder will hold a share, you'll have certain economic rights attaching to those shares. But because of the existing existence of these B shares, his share has a lesser voting right. So you could see it was quite a difficult thing for us to get approved with the regulators because it had an impact on the minorities as well. But as I understand it, you ended up in a situation where shareholders were not disadvantaged. So whether you were a to Stell shareholder or a Cape Finn shareholder, you were not diluted once the deal was restructured and complete. Is that correct? That's correct from an economic perspective. One should always remember that a share has economic rights and voting rights. Mm. Um, and none of the economic, economic rights were affected negatively. All the Cape Finn shareholders and the Distel shareholders ended up with exactly the same economic rights. Um, as I said, because of the existence of the B share, there were a dilution in their voting. Mm. Um, 
but I think you know we took the the transaction to all shareholders at both levels. Uh, that's also why it was complicated. We had to get it approved at, at the Cape Finn level and at the Star level. We were very clear about the dilution for shareholders, and you know we got a 99% approval for it. So for us, it was quite evident that shareholders were asking. Uh, before the collapse that the structure needs to change and they were willing to give up some of their votes to achieve that um, and keep put the company on a much better footing than it was before. Well, Ferdi, you have said, and I think Distel has said the same, that this deal is actually a game changer for Distel. Do you want to elaborate on, on how that is so and can a structure make such a difference? It can make a big difference. I mean, these structures existed uh, in our, in our uh, commercial history uh, for some time and they served a specific purpose. I don't think in the uh, current environment they, they served the pur purpose of control anymore. But one needs to remember that, I mean, a company grows through internal cash, through funding or from uh, funding from shareholders. Now, if you look at the structure that the Stel had, you could not go and uh, play with any of the shareholdings because it would clearly influence the voting that mm. the PIC had and the Dremgro had in this instance uh, through RCI. So they were never able to go to shareholders and do a rights issue, for example, to raise large amount of cash to grow um, and to expand. Um, and shareholders were asking, listen, this tell should expand and grow. So they were always reliant on their own internal cash, which has an impact on dividend flows to shareholders. Uh, and secondly, you have to go uh, borrow money. And there are limits to borrowings that you, that you can enter into. So it had a massive detriment on the company in terms of its ability to grow, uh, you know. Um, with the current structure, the, what we refer to as the collapse or the single layer structure, and having this B share attaching to, call it the Remgro share, the style can now go out and do rights issues to shareholders and raise, raise large amounts of monies and do acquisitions, for example. And that was the thing that the shareholders were asking for and they never got. Um, and I think they are now in a position to do that. Other big benefit, obviously, is um, with these holding structures, you had an inherent uh, value trap in the top listed company. For example, um, the Cape Finn shares were trading at a discount of roughly 14% to the underlying distal share. Uh, there were periods where that discount was 25%. That created a massive arbitrage position for shareholders because they could enter into the top company uh, and wanting to sit around and wait for this discount to widen or, or you know, lessen um, and then exit. So it, it had an influence on the tradability of the shares and, and also you know, the liquidity in the shares in the style were limited to 20%. So there was not a lot of trade and you could find that more of the trade happened in the Cape Finn level. By eliminating the whole structure, the discount is gone. You've got one entry point. Um, and the free float of the company is sitting at roughly 40% now, where previously it was 20%. Having a massive free float, more trade in the shares, you know, better reflection of the underlying value. So all in all, I think it was a, it was a massive benefit for shareholders. So it's really onwards and upwards for the style? It's really onwards and upwards for the style. Um, I think they've expressed in the press that uh, they are on an expansion drive. I think this will open the door for them. Um, and with the support of the shareholders, uh, I think they should be able to achieve that. Thank you for your time. Pleasure.